could we have a hand clap for all the baptisms again? <clears throat> I don't consider myself a, uh, a crier, but, but I'm glad it was a little dark in here when we were reading those testimonies. I know what you guys are thinking before we dive in today. I can't count on my hand how many times I've been asked about this polo. <laughs> it's true. I'm an Auburn fan. Thank you. Two of us, huh? <laughs> Yesterday, around the first quarter, we go up 10-0, I kind of tell my wife, and I'm thinking, you know what? I'm normally a blazer at church, but for tomorrow, I think I'm going to wear this polo. Well, by the end of the game, I started to text Billy and tell him I'm not preaching tomorrow. There's no way I'm coming to church. I want to dive right in today, and today we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. For whatever reason, we often believe that we're self-sufficient. Even when we give our life to Christ, a lot of times we limit the power of the Holy Spirit because of our lack of awareness or our willingness or not being willing to turn everything over to Christ. Many of us like to march to the beat of our own drum. And when it comes to walking this walk for Christ, we need help. As a child, I can remember going up in I always thought the Holy Spirit meant goosebumps. I thought the Holy Spirit was just an experience. I thought it was just tears when the worship service was high and I'm sitting there and I'm crying and and I now have goosebumps and I feel like going down to the altar and getting it right with God. Like, oh wow, the Holy Spirit was moving. That was true, but the Holy Spirit is much more than just feelings and tears and one experience. The Holy Spirit is God's Spirit working in us and around us, and we see real life change, just like we just saw here on this stage. If everyone, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 16. We're continuing this series, The Real Jesus, and we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and what that means. John chapter 16, and we're going to start reading at verse number 1. Before I read verse number one, I'm going to read verse 26 because it kind of pushes us right into verse number one. And the word of God says, when the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth, who precedes the Father, he will testify about me. You will also testify because you have been with me from the beginning. Verse one says, I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from the synagogues. Underline that if you're underlining your Bible. In fact, a time will come when anyone who kills you would think he's offering a service to God. They would do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But I have told you these things so that when their time comes, you will remember I have told you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. These first five verses here deals with the promise of persecution adversity, going through tough times. If I asked us by a show of hands, raise your hand if you say, "Woo, Jesus, thank you for allowing me to suffer. Nobody's going to raise their hand. But what if I told you that one of the key elements of this Christian walk is persecution? I often think of Paul when it comes to him suffering, and a lot of times we get this scripture out of context. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, and I truly believe that scripture to be true. But when you think about the context of that scripture, you're dealing with someone that prison, without, having a lot, having a little, people helping, people not wanting to help, people listen, people don't listen. So what he's saying in that scripture, because of who lives within me, who I am in Christ, I'm able to do all things. When it comes to suffering, we don't necessarily mind hearing about the promises of God as long as our comforts are met. We hear promises all the time, and we love them, but what about long-suffering, which is part of the fruit of the Spirit? We quote those other ones so eloquently, but when it comes to long-suffering, how many people want some of that? Not many of us. But if you really want to be connected to Christ, I'm here to tell you today that you're going to go through tough times. Persecution is going to happen. Tim Keller says it this way, suffering is at the heart of the Christian story. So if you are a Christian, at some point you're going to suffer. And what we're going to speak about a lot today, suffering is unbearable. 
if you aren't certain that God is for you and with you. The promise of persecution, it's a certainty. And we see right here in these first few verses, in my opinion, it's so tough. When I read the verse, they may, they're going to ban you from the synagogues. They think that they're doing God a favor once they kill you. Are we okay with realizing that the world and the people on the outside, are they're going to hate us? Sometimes that's a tough pill to swallow. We think just because we spread the gospel and great things are happening and Jesus sent you over there to do it, everybody's going to be so receptive. We think everybody's going to say, hey, great, woo, you bringing the good news. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. Give me a hug. What about when someone says, I don't want to hear that Jesus stuff? When someone says, hey, if you bring that Jesus stuff over here today, you may have to fight. How do we respond when we're hated? A lot of us, we struggle because we want everybody to love us. We want everybody to like us. The world is going to hate you. Persecution is a certainty. The world is going to hate you. James 4 and 4 says, to be friends with the world is to be an enemy of God. And we don't want to be an enemy of God. Dark and light doesn't mix. If you're going to be a true follower of Christ, you're going to go through tough times and the world's going to hate you. The next thing I want you to understand, but suffering for Christ is an honor. When I was coming up, blessed meant you had things. Blessed meant, oh man, they just have an easy, good life. If we see someone struggling or we see someone going through tough times, you know what we normally say, and I'm talking about people that are in the church, even outside of church. Oh, my God, what have they done wrong? Oh, my God, they, mu they must be so far from God. Why would God allow them to go through all those things if they're doing the right things? 1 Peter 3 and 14 says, if you suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Wow, that's a different meaning of blessed. If you suffer for Christ, you suffer for righteousness, you're blessed. Not just because you have things, and sure, God can bless us with a ton of things. But I believe when we start to mature in Christ, we realize that suffering is part of the process, and we learn to praise God even in the midst of what we're suffering through. Even when we can't see how we're going to get out of it, and that's part of it. Because we walk by faith and not by sight, and we're going to get there here in a second. God, I don't have to understand it. I don't have to see it. No one else has to agree with me. God, long as I have you, I have everything. But sometimes we don't realize how much it is and how much we actually have Jesus because we have so much. You don't realize how strong Jesus is in your life, so that's the only thing you have. And I know I have to move it right along because I know you guys are hungry, so I'll speed it up. Paul also says in Romans, suffering, in Romans 8, 16 through 18, suffering is not worthy to be compared to the glory that it will be revealed to us. We can suffer right now, but guess what? God has something for us later. I think of this lady, I think of this lady that I met in the summertime, and she was sharing this story about her brother, her brother having cancer, and they were going through all this stuff, and they were a great Christian family, and they're struggling, and the brother is sick, and, and she had all the faith in the world that God was going to heal him, and the brother dies. And she laid out before God, and she said, God, I've been praying to you this entire time, and I had faith. I stayed faithful to you, and you, I thought you were going to heal my brother. What happened? And she said, just like I'm talking to you, this is her testimony. She said, Jesus said, I did. He's with me. God's glory being revealed. Let's go to verse number five. But now I'm going away. To him who sent me, and not one of you asks, where are you going? Yet because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. When I read that, I was thinking, okay, Jesus, you just told me you're getting ready to leave, and we've been hanging out, and you're my Lord and Savior. You're getting ready to go. Of course I'm sad. Of course I'm sad. But nevertheless, I'm telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away because I don't go away. The counselor, underlined in your Bible right there, counselor, will not come to you. I try to put myself in the seat of these disciples. We're sitting around and they're talking to Jesus after the Passover and 
you know what? Hey, guys, I'm getting ready to go, but I'm going to tell you something. It's for your benefit that I leave. I don't know about you guys, but if Jesus is telling me that, I'm probably freaking out. I'm, I'm, probably, I'm probably about to have a heart attack. <laughs> I know that you are real. You're my Lord and Savior. Like, I know this, and you're telling me that you're getting ready to leave? Jesus, I'm not quite understanding that. And then on top of that, you're going to say that it's for my benefit? It's to my advantage? Now, when we read and we're looking through our lens, we know now that we have 2.6 billion Christians all over the world, which is amazing. But I'm sure right then, they didn't understand that plan. They didn't understand that plan. Jesus then was confined to a region. He was in this, his fleshly form. But look right now, look at all the Christians we have in here. We just saw 11 people baptized there, thinking about the ministry that Jesus is doing all over the world. Someone, look at your neighbor and say, Jesus has a plan. No, you have to say it with some conviction. Jesus has a plan. The benefit of Jesus' departure, we learn in these two verses here that Jesus had a plan for the disciples and he has a plan for us. Are you willing to follow that plan even when you don't comprehend or understand it, even when it, it's not logical? In these three verses, we see the word counselor there. We learn in the Greek, paraclete comes from this Greek word parakletos, which means comforter, counselor. The Holy Spirit is our counselor, our advocate. The benefit of Jesus' departure, we see over 2.6 million, I mean 2.6 billion Christians across the world. This is one of my favorite things right here. Jesus leaving allows us to be able to walk by faith and not by sight, and we know that scripture. But when it comes to walking by faith and not by sight, this is what I normally think of when I read that scripture. My faith connects me to a power source that I, don't, I can't see, but that power raises the dead, gives sight to the blind, heals the sick. Jesus, I don't understand everything that you're doing, but my faith connects me to a power that changes lives forever. And guess what? I don't have to understand how you do it. I just believe in you. Sometimes I believe we have that. We, we, we do. We have the easy part. But sometimes we make it complicated because we like to be self-sufficient. Jesus, how are you going to do it? Well, Jesus, you got my job. You know how much money I make. So, Jesus, let me think. We try to all make all this work in our mind. Jesus, I got my calculator out. I'm not going to have enough money at the end. Like, we try to figure all these things out on our own when we should just say, hey, Jesus, you are my provider, Jehovah Jireh. I'm not worried about it anymore. I prayed it to you. Jesus, I'm going to go on and do your will. Because all we do is sit there and worry ourselves to death about things we can't control anyway. Give it to Jesus. Let's continue to read. Let's continue to read. Let's go to verse number eight. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin. I want to pause right there for a second. Everybody look at me. If you say that you love Jesus and if you believe the Holy Spirit is down on the inside of you, if you can sin however you want to and you don't have some form of conviction, I question whether you know Jesus. I didn't expect to get many amens, but it's the absolute truth. If you say that you're walking with Christ and that you love him and you can do with your life whatever you want to, you don't have any thirst or any hunger for righteousness, you don't ever want to open your Bible, you never want to pray, you can treat people however you want to treat people without apologizing or going to fix it, I question whether Jesus is on the inside of you. Let's continue to read. When he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because they do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. And the judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth, for he will speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He would glorify me because he would take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. This is these last eight, verses 8 through 15. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit. If you write, if you write notes, please write this down. The Holy Spirit, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to help us, to guide us, 
to convict sin, to testify about Christ. Church, we need help. We need help. Church, I don't care how long you've been on this walk with Christ, guess what? You mess up sometimes. And sometimes what happens, if I could be honest with you, when you've been walking with Christ for a little while, a lot of times we get so far removed from certain types of sin till we start to put them in categories because we don't sin that way anymore. So we start looking down on other people and we so easily forget how we were. Can I be honest with you? I often, I work with young people all the time, 18 to 22 year olds, right? And since I work with 18 and 22 year olds, right, a lot of them do a lot of the same things. But guess what? A lot of us were 18 or 22 as well. On a scale of one to 10, how bad were you? <laughs> Somebody said 10. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> but guess what? Even if you were a one, you still desperately needed Jesus to save your life because your good wasn't good enough. No matter how good you think you are, it isn't good enough. It's as filthy rags in the eyesight of God. None of us are good. We all need Jesus. The Holy Spirit was sent here to help us to convict sin and to testify about Christ. Church, we all need the Holy Spirit to walk this walk. We can't do it on our own. We can't. We have to prioritize the Holy Spirit, our helper, our guide. That's why Jesus sent him here. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' Spirit in us. Something I want you guys to think about. When it comes to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it is revealing Jesus to us and to bear testimony about what Jesus is doing and what is to come. Is the evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life? Is Jesus working through you? Has your life radically been changed? I'm going to list off a few things that I know for a fact. When the Holy Spirit is involved, these things happen. I've seen horrible marriages reconcile because of the work of the Holy Spirit. I've seen kids come running back home just like the prodigal son because of the work of the Holy Spirit. I've seen the captives, people that have these terrible strongholds in their life, generational curses have ruined their families, and boom, it gets up to them, and you see the work of the Holy Spirit, and now those chains are broken because of the work of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, I've seen so many people that didn't know Jesus to be their Lord and Savior when the, the first time they hear the gospel, they sprint to Jesus. Sprint to Jesus. It warmed my heart a second ago, the courage that some of these people had to say, you know what, I thought I had it right. I'm going to be honest with you, church. It takes a lot of courage to look at a lot of people and say, I thought I was saved at one point, and then I realized that I wasn't. So many times people will allow people staring at them to stop them coming through the aisle so they can get right here. And those individuals say, hey, I thought I once was saved, then I realized I was missing something. And what I was missing was a real connection with Jesus. And in the Bible Belt, a lot of times we sometimes, uh-oh, we have a checklist. And as long as we do this checklist, it makes us feel good about who we are. I went to church today, check. I prayed 15 seconds when I woke up this morning, check. You know what, Jesus, I prayed over my food. I thank you for it. And most of us, we would pray about seven seconds because we're ready to eat. Check. And God, thank you for this amazing day. Check. Normally, the only time we pray any longer than that is when we're asking God for something. At the end of the day, the Holy Spirit brings life change. Look at the person next to you and say, are you changed? Say it one more time. Are you changed? When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, we are a new creation when we're in Christ. He's doing something new in us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. The old is gone. The new is here. I think about the lady at the well, who I'm sure people had a lot to say about her. 
she has a real encounter with Jesus, guess what? That's new. Her life was changed forever. I think about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. That's new. Jesus turning water into wine. That's new. Jesus healing the sick, the afflicted. That's new. Jesus giving sight to the blind. That's new. Seeing 25 people be baptized here today. Old, that's new. You and I being raised from death to life, that's new. I'm going to ask you guys a personal question, and I don't want you to look at your neighbor. I'm talking directly to you. Has the Holy Spirit changed your life? Are you different? Are you new? What's new about you? The Holy Spirit is in the life-changing business. Do you march to the beat of your own drum or are you following Jesus? The disciples didn't know what was to come. I, I think, you know, they may have had a, maybe had a hint or they just trusted Jesus. I'm going to ask you guys a question. Are you trusting Jesus enough to give him everything of you? because I'm going to tell you what it requires. I remember hearing a story once about a young guy. He's about 10 years old. And you guys know at church we pass around a collection plate. And everybody there at church had something to put in this collection plate. But this 10-year-old, he didn't have anything. And sometimes we need to be very similar to a kid. And this is why. They're passing around this big collection plate. It's huge. It's massive. So people can drop their money in. This young fella didn't have any money to put in. So as it got closer and closer to him, he's like, I don't have anything to put in there. But guess what, Jesus? I'm going to give you all I have, and I'm going to get in there myself. I don't have any money to put in but I'm hopping in. You can have every bit of me, every ounce. I'm not holding anything back. Jesus, you can have all of me. And when we give Jesus all of us, guess what? The Holy Spirit fills us. And we don't march to the beat of our own drum. We follow Christ. We follow Christ. The Holy Spirit, our comforter, our guide, our counselor, our help. We need him. And if you don't know right now where you're sitting, that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, you should make a decision today. Today is a great day. If I'm being honest with you guys, when I was getting ready to walk up here, I felt like I had already been preached to. I've been over there crying in my little corner. <laughs> because God is just that good. Because God is just that good. I'm going to ask everyone to close their eyes. And I'm done. And this is the question that I have for you today. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. You can't live a holy life without the Holy Spirit. If you're here today and you question whether the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, I'm going to ask that you be bold and raise your hand. If you truly want to follow Christ, 
It requires everything that you have, not what you don't. And I know what some people are thinking, well, he may not want me like this. Yes, he does. You can't clean yourself up. He wants you just like you are. And trust me and believe me. Trust me, believe me. Once you have a real encounter with Christ, you will never be the same. Today is an amazing day. We've seen some amazing things happen. I want you guys to look at me. We have a saying back home in my home state when something amazing happens like what we've seen here today, 25, 24 baptisms. A preacher would always say after an amazing day like today, aren't y'all so happy we made the devil mad today? And this is what I'm going to leave you guys with. We need the Holy Spirit to live a holy life. And if we're going to walk by faith and we're going to avoid sin and we're going to make a difference in this world, it's by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. We see all over in the book of Acts, after being filled with the Holy Spirit, So when you leave here today, something practical that I want you to do, the next thing that you do, whatever it may be, when you're walking into work and someone's getting on your nerve that you got to speak to and smile at. I know when I go to work tomorrow, I'm going to see a whole lot of Georgia gear, and guess what? I'm reporting them all to HR. (laughs) I want you to ask when you pray, God, allow your spirit to fill me so I can do your will and not my own. And Jesus, you will get all the glory. God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the amazing work that we've seen here. God, you're so faithful. We love you. If we had a thousand tongues, God, we couldn't praise you enough. We couldn't thank you enough. The lives that are transformed, God, by the gospel, by your word, Allow us to realize the significant role that we play. And God, we're asking that you continue to fill us with your spirit so we can do your will. Allow us to do our part. And the only way we can do our part, Jesus, is you working through us. God, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name I humbly pray. Everyone says amen. You're dismissed.